I also got a good right there because it's the reflection. I don't get there. I got no idea. do with the ears of this? The Notions 12. All I know is while we were shooting and the cast was enjoying the experience of being in Europe, that there was a lot of discussion about, hey, when are we going to do this again? And I just said, you couldn't pick a worse time to talk to me about that, because I'm in hell. But you know what it comes down to is, is there anywhere to go? For Ocean's 13, that it's set in Vegas. This is the only way we can do it. If you pull it off, you could really sing. Run it for me. Don't leave anything out. Give me the big picture. When we started, we didn't really think of it as a trilogy at the time, but then Steven and I sat down and talked about it, and we decided there's a different version for us to do to sort of close this thing out. The way I described Ocean's 12 to everybody was, it's the most expensive episode of a 60s television show ever. It was fun to watch, but we realized that the script was too long and that there were too many things going on. Once you've got a movie that people really love, like Eleven, and you suddenly give them something that they weren't expecting, it's like, oh wait, all the rules just changed. So I think we learned a little bit from 12 and we're able to come to 13 realizing, okay, we're continuing the story as if the movies never stopped. Where is he? Gotta go. I thought 13 would never happen. And then, lo and behold, Jerry Weintraub got a hold of two terrific writers, and they wrote a terrific script. When I read it, I said, hey, this is the best one yet. In a way, we've been preparing to write this movie for our whole lives. We've read every book about con artists and thieves that we could get our hands on from when we were kids in the stacks at the local library. So when we began having conversations with Soderbergh, we were all able to calibrate where you'd need to take this next. To keep it fresh, but in the tradition of the Ocean's movies. Linus, we're gonna need you to play a big part in this movie. All that matters to me right now is Ruben's health. How big? And I thought it, it did feel a lot like Ocean's Eleven. It had a lot of the fun and, and, uh, and humor and jokes. And like the moon catches the light. Ruben, I'm going to go ahead on and leave this. And with the huge heist as the centerpiece, it felt kind of like a return to that. And we wanted to kind of revisit Vegas. Vegas has a cachet, you know. That's where all the money is. And we're going to rob money, so we might as well go there, you know. If you're going to rob a bank, find a bank. <laughs> It really seems like these movies live in Vegas. But 13, for us, is about friendship. First time I met Ruben, he looked me off getting cheated at an all-dealers game at the El Rancho. Then he bought me breakfast. That's a central question, a central theme. Is, you know, what are you willing to do for someone you call friend? Ruben, he always was too trusting. Is, so, is. And the idea that something serious like that is sort of the jumping off point for the movie was something that George felt strongly about from the beginning. There's a different angle than the second one, which is it's not about getting rich. You know, we already made money. Now it's about getting even with somebody who hurt our friend. Anybody want to walk away? So? I said I was walking away. Let's gut the son of a. There's nothing better than having what we call come up in somebody who deserves to be revenged. And this has that. It has a villain of unequal proportion. A man named Al Pacino, who plays a character called Willie Bank. I'm Willie Bank, and welcome to the bank. He's a, a I guess, a sort of megalomaniac. 
type guy, whatever that means. Everything is his work. Everything is the hotel. Yes, sir. To the point where it sort of blinded him. In my book, this establishment is uh, aces. The ace of diamonds. I hope. That was fun to play. Hey, yo, it's the bank! Hey, I love that commercial you're doing. That's great. When the other cast members found out it was going to be out, they all got very excited. <laughs> and I had a sense he would really fit right in with this group, that he would find it really easy to play with us, and he did. How many machines has he rigged? Go ahead, smile. You're not gonna be smiling long, let me tell you that. Did I ever meet you? <laughs> <laughs> Until the director says cut, I'll just get <laughs> The very first scene I did with him, I was very nervous, because it's Al Pacino, you know. I'm just trying to hold my own with the big star. Some guys I take seriously tell me you're a serious guy. But the minute you put Al actually into it, it? the stakes it. just soar. We don't say sorry. I don't want to hear sorry. <laughs> That's where the scenes should start. And then go, to, then go to George. The first day he came to work, he said to me, what do these guys think of me? You know, Clooney, Pitt, and Damon. What do they think of me? I said, it's very simple, Al. What did you think of Brando when you did The Godfather? That's what they think of you. Great to meet you, too. Good to meet you. Yeah, because we had Al, we put Godfather illusions throughout the movie. Mark. And the first one is in that scene out at the construction site. George says to him, What I want, what's most important to me, is that Reuben gets his share of the hotel restored. It's a really seminal moment for The Godfather. And at the end of the scene, we all said to Al, hope you were comfortable with that. And he said, with what? Like, he didn't remember it at all. And so he didn't pick up on it until afterwards, but then he loved it. One of the best things about doing this movie is seeing all the guys again. These men are all very, very intelligent. All of them tremendously educated. And yet they're the silliest human beings I've ever seen. <laughs>、like But the guys all kind of look the same to me. Except George has so much gray hair. Everybody's grown since we started the first one. All the stars are bigger than they ever were. And they're always shooting a picture, so it's very hard to get them scheduled and get them to take a chunk of time like this. Who else but Jerry can you know make this thing come together again for the third time? Once more, one more time. Come on. Yo, my man. Having to be able to orchestrate this movie yet again is a real coup for him as a, as a producer. Good to have you back, Jenny. Got some gray goose on ice for you. He、and、produced a way of doing it by building an eight million dollar set on、uh, Warner Brothers lot. Which would enable him to shoot whenever the people were available. Very nice, Jerry. Anything I can do to help you? <laughs> He was very smart about it because if you think about the producing costs of, of doing it in the Bellagio and the Per Diem, it came out cheaper. We couldn't actually afford a real casino this time. So they had to、uh, make one. These are all fake. These walls are all fake. They're、um, cardboard and. Paper. So, in hindsight, it seems like the most obvious thing in the world to build it. And also, the action that takes place in here, I think, would have been extremely difficult to accomplish on location. One of the things that was exciting about going back and doing this one more time was the knowledge that we were going to create from scratch a brand new casino. I had described to Phil Messina, the production designer, the kind of feel that I wanted. 
And I said, you know, design a casino made by a billionaire crazy person. And he went to town. He built a set, ladies and gentlemen, you will not believe. When I came in, I was like this. We built the set in 12 weeks, which sounded impossible when we started. And by the time we finished, we still thought it was impossible. The aesthetic of the hotel was sort of the Asian theme. I used the Vegas aesthetic when it was advantageous, and I'd left all the rest of Vegas behind. So I thought, you know, if I'm gonna get to do this, I'm gonna do it my way, even if it doesn't look like any other casino in Vegas. And in fact, it shouldn't look like any other casino in Vegas. There was no hotel this cool that I saw in Vegas, and I mean that. They couldn't find a hotel that was both this well done and this grotesque. Stand by, just with the towel ready. And also with the director, like Steven Soderbergh, and I thought, boy, that camera's really gonna be moving here. We wanted to be able to walk in and shoot anywhere in any direction without having to ever light anything. Snake eyes, all of it. And uh, enabled us to exert an amount of control over the casino. The orchestration, the, the way that things are happening is really, really masterful and intricate. And I think that came from the fact that they did have control over the entire environment. All right, the bureau's in the house. If they move towards Blackjack, somebody tip Livingston. And also, Steve and I had talked about making it much more dynamic with adding the element of verticality to it. And most casinos are all about real estate. They just go on for miles and miles. This one, we didn't have that opportunity, so I decided that going up and going multi-levels would basically triple our footprint. The idea of being up here is that the whole landscape changes again from down below. So it's almost like, in theory, another whole part of the set. This ends up feeling larger than what it is, that you don't always get a sense you're in one big space, that you're really sprawling throughout the casino. People come in here, and after five minutes, they think they're in a casino. They forget they're on a soundstage. We've done this thing in total, complete detail, you know? We could open this place tomorrow and have gaming, which I'd like to do. <laughs> The hotel itself became another character in, in the movie. And the heist was really fun, really exciting. You ready? I was born ready. Steven had a really good handle on exactly how all those pieces fit together. And something that we came up with right away was this idea of no losing bets for a period of time, flipping the whole way a casino is built so that the patrons win every time. I think America will love that. I don't know anybody who doesn't want to beat the casino. We beat the game in this one. Oh my God, I'm the winner! <laughs> it's lots of little pieces that add up to the giant con, right? You're gonna take out craps this way, you're gonna take the slots this way, blackjack that way. And so we did a lot of research into how, with unlimited resources, you could really flip each game. And because of Jerry Weintraub's connections in Las Vegas, we were able to go places that you can't go. They let us sit in the eye in the sky and watch the way they catch people. Pupil dilation, elevated heartbeat. <laughs> it's legitimate. And they let us throw questions out to them, you know, if you wanted to get crooked dice on a table, how would you do it? And how would you fix the automatic shufflers? So we were able to piece together sort of all sorts of different ways to try to rob a casino. And so things like that within the story led to fun things that we could do with the style. Because we knew with 13 that we would have to really work hard to compress time. Steven had wanted to do something with split screens. The day of the grand opening, there were so many things happening at once that you had to accelerate, otherwise it just becomes redundant. As in the first, you've got a lot of moving pieces and a lot of things for the audience to keep track of. So it gave me a chance to really, really go for it. Let's maybe see that these three things are happening at once, or maybe four things, or five. And then what are the important moments within that puzzle? 
we'll do a mirror image of the same moment happening over in, in multiple frames. When people started winning money in the casino, Steven said, I, I gotta see those numbers. So we talked with uh, Tom Smith, the visual effects supervisor, about putting these neon numbers floating above people's heads as if it were a video game. And the first time we saw it with an audience, and those numbers came on the screen, you could feel everybody in the room thinking, oh, money, 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 money. You immediately understand it in a very visceral way when you see that amount of money. Again, this is the Ocean series. The style of the movie is just have fun. Let the audience enjoy what they're seeing and don't hide the fact that we're making a movie. Don't hide the fact that we're trying to entertain and do something cool. And action. We can't pull this off. It's just one thing too many. Even though they're a very stylistic type of film, there's a reality to them because of the manner in which Steven shoots him, and he gets the nuance of what the actors are trying to do. Please keep it in slow mo. Oh, yeah, it is. <laughs> the Ocean's films are really about tone. The tone is very, very specific, and that's provided more opportunity for our characters to come out and show themselves. You know, when they were digging the tunnel, they had teams of guys monitoring this. Yeah? How many? Teams. So getting the comedy in the script, in a way we just had to set it up so that the story tracked and that there were comic opportunities. But this is a funny group of actors. I mean, between Brad, Damon, George, Scott and Casey. You're a midget in 34 states. An animal in the other 34. I mean, every one of these guys is like comic genius. <laughs> it was like we had to just find a way to just like serve the ball up and let them spike it. So we got the idea that we'd send Casey's character to a factory in Mexico to fix these loaded dice. And then we thought, you know, while he's there, why doesn't he start a labor movement? That storyline is great. That's actually my favorite one in the film. And incidentally, yeah, all of Virgil's scenes are in Spanish. Get aire acondicionado. Este way. Aquí está, mira. There's been a lot made of the practical joking on the set of these things. Casey did a great one there, which was right before shooting, he started to sort of intimate that he really didn't speak Spanish. My Mexican accent's not that great. He was starting to make people nervous, and when cameras rolled, of course, he had it fluently. I luckily speak a little bit of Spanish, so when I got to that part, I thought, like, thank God it's not Chinese. And then when it came to Danny and Rusty, we just took the liberty of giving them these inane conversation that, that we have all the time. You okay? Yeah, no, I just bit into a pepper. One of our favorite moments, that Oprah scene and that conversation, that's just something out of our lives. Like he's an Oprah watcher and I'm an Oprah denier. But then if I happen to get an eyeball on the screen when she's going, I get sucked in and then suddenly everything stops. And it's not just about the kids. I mean, I'm happy for the kids. So to watch those two guys carry out like the sort of alpha male movie star version of our ridiculous conversation was extremely rewarding. Sorry. Hey, why does he no, get he's to a go VIP? In... So what's that make me? A VUP? A very unimportant person? And then the way that we came up with the very unimportant person was Stephen had a big book. Between 12 and 13, whenever he had an idea that he thought could work for Ocean's 13, he would write it down. He'd say something like, there should be a really bad smell. And everyone reacts to this smell. And so the VUP was a great way to actually service a bunch of these thoughts that Stephen had and then put all the plagues on this one poor sucker. Hello. I'd like a table for one. I hear your risotto is tremendous. It was pretty obvious in terms of what was on the page what was gonna happen to me. There's some sort of terrible smell in here. The fun about playing a character like that is that there's a real build to every horrible thing that happens to me. Her Highness is so very sensitive to smells. It's just piling one after another. 
it's kind of sad, funny, funny, sad. But Stephen wanted to keep it light and funny in terms of my frustration and my anxiety and my irritation, which are all more comic ways of approaching it. You guys been talking to my father? Why would we do that? Well, that's not a no. And it was fun to sort of be the final piece of Linus's little journey. I mean, we got to let him come into his own as Pepperidge. So we've got the giant nose on Matt, which was priceless. The little backstory is that he's got this prop that he's been dying to use, and you see him on the phone with his father, and his father's telling him that, you know, a real operator doesn't, doesn't use props. But sure enough, he puts on this, this very big nose, and that kind of gets him in a little bit of trouble. You can't beat Matt Damon with that nose. I mean. <laughs> and the nose plays. And the nose does play. The nose plays. It's great. It's huge. Great stuff. Thanks. I mean, can you think of another giant superstar leading man who would willingly say, give me the ugliest, biggest, fake nose you can, and I'll wear it for half the movie? about Matt Damon, he seems to enjoy acting more than most actors I've ever seen. Whether he's, you know, the low man in the scene, whether he's getting picked on, every aspect of it he seems to enjoy. You know, so deep into Pepperidge, I'm, I don't even have to think, I just react. It's just working for me. You know what, okay, great. Knowing him, and knowing his twisted, wicked sense of humor and his willingness to go anywhere, <laughs> we wanted to give Matt something very special in this film. I finally got a love interest in one of these movies, and Ellen is a blast, so we had a really good time shooting the scenes. On in, and out. It's really fun to watch her put these guys into hot water, because she's so smart and sexy. Ooh. What was that? You felt it, too. It's fun to do comedy with somebody who is as inventive and spontaneous and original as Matt Damon is. Such a cool person, you can get it done. Get it off like that, because I'm a pro. I think between Maddie and myself and Steven, it was just an understanding that nothing was too much. Let's just get these off, right? Now. Get them off? Yeah. Off. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and that Steven could always pull it back if he wanted to. <laughs> That's really good. I knew that we were sort of crossing the line into farce. My feeling was, as long as it's funny, we can get away with pushing outside the genre just a little bit. Oh, those are nice. They're so I'm not gonna lie to you. The whole storyline is pretty goofy. I mean, it could be the end for me and Barkin. That could be the, the absolute end of our careers. We'll be doing dinner theater and in Coconut Grove. Oh, right there. FBI. Oh, dear God. I think Matt's performance, the humiliations that he goes through are, I think, fun to watch. Not fun to be a part of, but fun to watch. But I love that we've built a, a world in which you're equally interested in all the characters. Like, it's just as fun to watch Don Cheadle and Scott Kahn as it is to watch George and Brad. Every one of those guys had something about them that made them unique and, you know, funny in their own way. Hey, what's your... Okay, then. It did seem like in 13 that the writers rediscovered what each guy was good at. Their very specific skills, and they brought it to the film. In 13, we wanted to kind of honor that and what had come before, and then as you got into it, see everybody for who they still were. Why weren't these diamonds on the agenda to begin with? Because it can't be done. But the beauty of this movie, and of course the other ones, always lies in the interrelationship of the characters. When's opening night? July 3rd. Well, we're going in now? It's already open. No, it's a soft opening. To test the place before the grand opening. Yeah, it's kind of like an out-of-town preview, only it's in town. So when is opening night? July, July 3rd. 3rd. And people now know the characters so well, so now they see sort of a running character trait between all of them. And the writers and, and Steven and keep picking at those threads, you know, keeping those idiosyncrasies of the characters alive, which makes it entertaining. Even though Banks stepped over the line, we have to do what's best for Reuben. Which means we offer Bank a Billy Martin. No, that's the rules for someone who understands the rules, which Bank don't, because he already broke them. So he don't get the chance. For Reuben, I think we give him a chance. All the movies have a real emotional pull to them. And so all of us knowing that it was very likely this would be the last one of these movies, 
We had to find something sweet at the end. And Stephen knew how he was going to shoot that so that those reflections would land on their faces. You know, a lot of the scenes in this movie, we'd have to rewrite many times. But that ending, that came easily. Seeing who those guys were and, and getting to find a way to let them express their hearts was really exciting. And that was a moment where the actors and Steven just completely elevated what we had been thinking of. What's this? That's just the deed to 4.6 acres of prime real estate at the north end of the Strip. The fireworks in 13 was definitely a very specific callback to the moment in the first movie. And seeing that and thinking about that, I felt it's a metaphor for Steven and these same people, that same crew that have been together for so long. And the camaraderie and what a great family they all are together. So taking that moment to just recognize it and pay tribute to it, it becomes very emotional. I knew it, was, it could be a wonderful film, but as soon as Steven Soderbergh and everybody in the cast came aboard, it became a piece of magic. Matt, you can lean in a little bit here. There you go. I never thought, you know, it would go this long. It's been great. You know, this is one of those rare treats where it turns out good, and then you do another one, and then you get to do a third one. I feel really lucky. For me, being a stage actor, I look down on everything Hollywood, just instinctively, reflexively. And then suddenly, I was among these people. And not only were those guys smart, they were funny. They're generous people, to a man. Like, I'm not even kidding to, to be able to say that, because it's easy to look at stars and go, oh, yeah, they're stars, but... There is no but. Those guys are great people. Every one of them. <laughs> Working with Bernie Mac was a great treat. And he was just the funniest guy off camera in the world. You know, huge affection for Bernie. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what we'll always hold on to. It's a, a shame that he's gone. It's sad, and I'm glad I got to do three movies with him. Bernie was one of the funniest human beings that ever was in the game. And uh, a sweet, genuine dude. And yeah, man, Bernie, Bernie was a bad motherfucker, you know, excuse my language, but that's, that's, that's what he deserved, you know what I mean? This entire group of people sort of have the same theory about what it is we do for a living, which is that if we're not enjoying what we do for a living, then we're idiots because we all got lucky. Oh, I'd be happy to keep working with these guys, you know, as long as they'll have me. At my age, audiences would know me from the show of shows. That's 1950. And then the Dick Van Dyke show. But now I've got a new identity. People would say, you're the guy from Oceans. That was no, thrilling. To, to be able to make a modest contribution to this franchise has been a great gift. It's kind of cliche to say, you know, I love all the guys, but I, I really did. And every day on the set, we're just laughing. So it was just fun to go to work. It was a joy to do. <laughs> it's a crime. We should not be getting paid for this. It's just been a laugh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you know. yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, thank you, everybody. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. Thank you. All right. Steven, what do you think about making another Oceans film? I don't know what to say other than, I would never say absolutely not, but I just, I, right now, I can't imagine what it would be. Where do you send them? All I've got is, you know, this image of Brad Pitt going, Tokyo, man, let's go to Tokyo. See you when I see you. Wow. Yeah.